Welcome to this course on Introduction to React provided to you by Wintelect Now. My name is Eric Green, and I'll be walking you through some of the basics of using React. We'll take a look at how to set up a basic uh, React programming environment, how to build a Hello World component, how we can work with uh, things like properties and state, and then finally how we can interact with form controls. So here's our course overview. We're going to take a look at a starter project. We're going to take a look at how it's set up, how to pull it down from GitHub, kind of walk you through the components. We're not going to be coding all of the uh, development tooling from scratch. We'll be, we'll be focusing in on React, but you can take a look at that development tooling to understand how the various parts and pieces are put together. Next, we're going to dive into a Hello World component. We're going to basically set up a React component. We're going to render it to the DOM and uh, take a look at what that looks like in the uh, web browser. Next, we're going to take a look at JSX. It's a, uh, basically, it's an, an extension to JavaScript that allows us to speed up our development of React components. And we're going to talk about how we can use Babel to transpile JSX files out to plain old JavaScript. Then we're going to take a look at component props, the um, immutable properties that are used to configure our components and are used when rendering them. Then we're going to take a look at component state. We're going to take a look at how state can be changed within a React component. And then finally, we're going to talk about working with forms and how that is a lot different than what you might be used to when working with other JavaScript frameworks and libraries. So first of all, what is React? If you actually head over to the React website, it'll tell you that it's a JavaScript library for building user interfaces. Uh, it's kind of similar to uh, Backbone views, kind of similar to um, to Angular directives. It just provides a, a really nice, uh, easy way to build the various uh, elements or components of your of your user interface. Unlike things like um, like handlebars or Angular, uh, React actually focuses on JavaScript code, not HTML templates. So you're not going to be doing any type of, of, of decorating of HTML templates to inject some type of JavaScript UI functionality. Instead, you're going to be writing all of this in JavaScript code. Um, React components are composable. It's not about just building you know, one component that does everything. You, you break down a larger component into many smaller components and then compose them together to build the larger component. This allows for greater code reuse, better unit testing, that kind of thing. Um, unlike other frameworks like an Angular, for example, that does two-way data binding, uh, React uses a one-way reactive data flow. Basically, data is always flowing in one direction. So we're never taking a model property and updating the UI, and then the UI directly updates the model property back. Instead, the way React works is a you have some type of, of state or property value that populates an input field. You interact with the input field that triggers a change event on the input field. That change event then runs a piece of JavaScript, which then updates the corresponding state, usually on a parent component. And then, um, and then that state is then propagated back through the entire, um, the entire collection of components, and everything gets re-rendered. This way, there's never any confusion about what the, what, what the actual current value on the state is, what's actually being shown in the DOM, and trying to reconcile all of those differences through that one-way direction flow of data, it makes everything a lot easier to understand. Um, efficiently handles DOM manipulations. Uh, for the most part, when you're working with React components and you're not really doing anything too complex or crazy, um, all of the DOM manipulations are handled directly by React itself. You basically just modify the state of a component, have that, com have that state propagated down through the properties, and then React um, does its, its handiwork and actually uh, updates its virtual DOM and then compares the virtual DOM to the real DOM and then looks for what's changed and then makes the appropriate selective updates to the DOM as opposed to just kind of throwing everything away. So when you're working with, uh, with React, you're not focused so much on manipulating the DOM yourself. You, you let React handle that for you. Finally, it's also commonly said that React represents the V or the view in the MVC pattern. 
And so when we're talking about React, we're not, we're not really talking about the underlying data models. We're not really talking about controllers. We're certainly not talking about the models or data storage up on the server. We're just talking about an easy to reason way of building components and keeping them updated and keeping the actual component data synchronized with the DOM. To get started here, we actually need to download a course starter project. Um, well, you can definitely do a simple React page just by including a couple of JavaScript files off of, off, off of a CDN. Typically, to do any type of, of real React programming, there's a couple of, of pieces of technology that you need to pull into your project to make everything work right. Um, something to transpile the JSX, something to, combi to, to combine all the JavaScript files into a single file, something to help manage um, your modules. If you're using any type of CSS, you might want to include SAS or less. So there's, there's a, number, a number of different components we want to pull in to actually do real development. And so instead of being distracted by that configuration in this particular course, I've prepared all of that ahead of time, and all we basically need to do is make sure that we have Node installed and that we pull down those starter files. And then finally at the end, the um, completed files from the course are also available on a different GitHub repo, which you'll see down here at the bottom, Intro to React Demo. So let's take a quick look at a demonstration on how to install uh, Node.js, Gulp, as well as Webpack. So let's install Node.js as well as Gulp and Webpack here so that we can run the starter solution. To install Node.js, you can come to nodejs.org. And uh, we're interested in installing the LTS version. As of the recording of the video, this LTS version is 4.3.1. Uh, it should work with 5, but I have not tested any of the demonstrations with 5, and so I recommend that you use version 4. Uh, don't use version .12 or .10 if you have those on your system. The, the actual V8 engine for running the JavaScript code will simply be too old. So you want to def de definitely want to go with version 4 here. Uh, to install it, you simply click on it, and it's going to download it. And then after it's downloaded, we're going to click Run. And uh, we're going to be, uh, we're going to have the setup wizard will, will uh, pop up here, and then we're going to click next and go through and actually just accept the license terms. We'll go with the default folder, have it install it, and now it's going to go through and actually do the installation process. If you have an older version already installed, it will automatically upgrade it to this version. Um, also, too, if you're using a Mac, they have a similar installer for installing it on a Mac, and then with uh, Linux boxes, you can just download a pre-compiled binary. Okay, so once you have that done, the next thing we need to do is actually install um, some modules globally. So we're going to come over here and we'll go to the Node.js command prompt. And I'll make this a little bit larger in size. So we'll say properties, font, and I'm going to make that 36. And then we'll come into here. And now I'm going to do the following. I'm going to say npm install dash g gulp and webpack both of these are needed in order to um, successfully run the starter project dash g just means that they're going to be installed globally so that any project can make use of them and there we go we now have gulp and webpack installed so let's take a quick look at how to pull down these course starter files from github okay so now we're going to download the course starter files I actually have two GitHub repos set up here. This first one that you see is the actual repo that you're going to want to clone from or download from. This basically has the starter files with none of the completed demonstrations. I have a second repo that ends with dash demo, and this actually has the completed uh, demonstration files. And I'm going to be posting my files up to here as we go through the um, as we go through the course. So for those who are familiar with Git, you can simply clone this. For those who are not familiar with Git, you can actually come over here and click on the download zip button and download an archive or a zip file of this source code and then extract it and then you can work from there. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to clone the demo one so that I can post the files up. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to come over to here. Now you'll notice I'm using the node.js command prompt. Um, this command prompt has all the environment variables and stuff set up um, for Node. This is actually, uh, this configuration is installed when you installed Node.js. 
So if I come over here and I actually click on all apps, you're going to see if I scroll down where it says Node.js, and then you'll see Node.js command prompt. Now this is not the Node repo environment. This is the actual regular Windows command prompt, but with the with but with the um, with the Node.js environment variables configured. So coming back over to here, I'm going to say git clone, and I'm going to paste my URL into there, and I'm going to hit enter. And this is now going to create the folder intro to React demo, and it's going to bring down all of the files that are loaded in there. Yours should say intro to React without the demo part. And for those who downloaded the zip, just simply extract the zip and then, and then change into that folder through the command prompt. So there we go. Now I'm inside my folder. I can do a DIR and we can take a look at all the files that are actually in here. Now I'm going to be editing this uh, project with Visual Studio Code. You're welcome to use any editor you would like. One nice thing about Visual Studio Code is that it does have support for Git and it does have support for something called JSX, which we're going to learn about later on in the class. So now I can say code dot and you're going to see Visual Studio Code launch here. So now we've got our intro to React demo files. Also, as we open these files, for example, package.json, it will make that file available here in our working files. Now, before we can actually do anything in terms of actually running this, the, uh, the actual starter files, we actually have to install some node packages. So we have this thing here called package.json, which lists all the package dependencies for, um, for, the, for the starter file. So we all, all we simply have to do is say npm install, and you don't have to specify a package name after this. This will actually go read the package.json file and then download all of the packages that are needed. So we'll do npm install, and it is going to download the packages. Okay, so now all of our packages have been downloaded here. In order to run this, we're actually going to have to have two command prompt windows. One command prompt is going to be running a, uh, a gulp task that will do the automatic processing of our files. We'll also have another command prompt window running, which will run another gulp task to actually fire up the server. So to, to actually get our program files actually up and processing, I'm going to type in gulp. And when this runs, you're going to see that now we are running gulp. And then I'm going to create a second window. Now, I already have a second window here. If you want to create a second window, you can right click and then click on Node.js command prompt again. And this will actually create a second window for you. So I'm going to come into here. I'm going to change into my intro to React demo folder. And from here, I'm going to type gulp server. So the first one started up our processing, and the second one is going to fire up the web server. Now that we have our web server up and running, we're going to go ahead and load up a hello world file. Now this hello world file is not using React. It's just straight up um, hello world in an HTML file. But this will verify that we were able to, in fact, load up the web server and then load up a web page off of it. So we'll click on this here. And we're going to come over to here and we're going to do localhost 8080 and we can see that hello world is loaded now if the uh, port 8080 is already being used um, on your system by another program in the next demonstration i'll show you how you can change that port number so that you can uh, use a different port if 8080 is not available and by the way, all of these um, setup commands that we've done here uh, inside of uh, Windows equally work on Linux and Mac for their respective um, terminal programs and such. One nice thing about using Node.js is that it is cross-platform. Now let's do a quick little overview of the various tools that are being used here. First of all, you have to have Node.js. If you haven't already installed that on your system, go ahead and do that. Basically, this is Google's V8 JavaScript engine, but using it on the server. So instead of interacting with various web browser APIs, you'll be interacting with various APIs that are available on the server. Um, we're going to use Node.js to power not only the actual web server for serving up the application, but we're going to use Node.js to actually power our development tooling. 
Um, we're going to use Gulp. Gulp is a JavaScript task runner. If you're not familiar, familiar with Gulp, you might be familiar with Grunt. Um, both, of the, both of them kind of do the same thing. Gulp, so Gulp is what we're going to be using to pre-process all of our source code files as well as to actually run the web server itself. Um, I've included SAS. We're not really doing anything with CSS or SAS um, in this particular course, but having a CSS preprocessor wired up for doing um, typical web development is very common. So I've included that here as well, just as part of the, 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 the course starter files. And a few places where we actually do a little bit of CSS coding will make use of the SAS there. Also, we have something called Babel. This is our JavaScript transpiler. It's basically going to transpile the the JSX content as well as our ECMAScript 2015 content, it's going to transpile that out to ES 5.1. Um, a lot of web browsers are now supporting um, ES 2015, but it's still not universally supported. And one of the nice things about React is you don't have to use the latest and greatest web browser to actually make use of it in your application. You can you can transpile the JavaScript files out to an earlier version of JavaScript and then be able to use it on older browsers as well. Um, Webpack, this is kind of the latest, greatest, newest way of packaging up and modularizing your client-side um, JavaScript files. So we'll be using Webpack, and um, it'll, show up, it'll show up throughout the course when we start talking about requiring this module or exporting this particular module. It's a real nice, convenient way to organize your, your client-side application. Uh, next, we'll have Express. Um, Express is what's going to be used to actually configure the web server. Express itself isn't really a, a web server per se. The actual web server is the actual HTTP, HTTP module built into Node. But Express makes it really easy to configure that module. So we'll be using that to serve up some web application files. While this is not an Express class, I will quickly show you what that file looks like just so you're aware of what it's doing. And finally, for all of our development and testing here, we're going to be using Visual Studio Code and Microsoft Edge. Visual Studio Code is... Um, is uh, one of the latest um, developer tool offerings um, provided by Microsoft is actually a really, really nice editor, very similar to things like Atom and Sublime in brackets. And uh, then we'll take a look at Edge, and uh, we'll take a look at some of the developer tools that are available with it as well as we work through our demonstrations and view the web pages. Okay, let's do a quick project scaffolding walkthrough here and see what we're working with. So let's take a quick look at the project scaffolding that we have here. This will not be an exhaustive coverage of using Gulp to configure a project, but I'll give you enough information to kind of get a good sense for what we're doing here. Now inside of Visual Studio Code, if you want to make the text larger, um, so I'm going to do that here so you can see it a little better, you can actually hold down Control and then hit Plus, and it'll actually make everything a little bit larger, easier to read. Okay, so let's take a look here at our project. Um, You'll see that we have a dist folder, a node modules folder, and a source folder. If you go back to source control, you will see the source folder, but you will not see the node modules or the dist. The node modules folder was created when we said npm install and downloaded all the packages. The dist folder was created when we ran the gulp command. It took all of the files that were inside of the source folder, processed them, and produced a final output. So what you see here in the dist folder is, for example, what you could push up to like a cloud server or something to actually host the application for real. Now down here in our project, you're going to see where we have something called a gulp file. The gulp file contains all of the tasks necessary to process the various, par the various parts of our application. For example, you're going to see one that's called SAS that actually does the processing of the SAS files. You'll see one called Webpack, which is actually going to package up all of our modules. You'll see another one called Copy, which will actually um, uh, copy over the files. Okay. Now we have a number of different tasks set up. Under the um, Webpack task, you'll notice that there's a task for Babel. And if we come up to the Babel task, you'll see that we have some configuration here for actually transforming our JSX files as well as the ES2015 syntax out to ES5.1 syntax. This, this Babel component here is really important for React programming so that we can actually code in JSX in our editor but then automatically have JavaScript files created for us that can actually be understood by the web browser itself because the web browser doesn't understand JSX. Now underneath our source folder here, this is where we're actually going to be doing all of our coding. And you can see here so here in our server.js file, this is where we're actually firing up the actual web server itself. 
So you can read through this if you'd like. Um, we actually have our port number stored here in config.json. So if you want to change the actual port number that's used to fire up the web server, you would do it here inside of this file. And finally down here we have an index.json file which actually reads the config.json file and can also fire up the web server as well. Our actual web files are going to go inside of this WW folder right here inside of source. We have a site.scss, this is actually a SAS file. And then down here we have a JavaScript folder that has a JSX file where we're going to be putting in our React JSX uh, content as well as a widget data JavaScript file that contains our widget data. And then of course here we have our index.html file and there's the hello world that we saw in an earlier demo. Now inside of here we are referencing um, some, some bootstrap content. We're also referencing our site.css. This is produced from our site SAS file. And then down here this is the webpack file. It takes all of the JavaScript code and combines it into one file. Not just our JavaScript code but the actual third party libraries like React that we're making use of. All right, so let's go ahead and build our Hello World React application or component here. So React, or React is not limited to web application UIs. It can be used for native applications as well. And the reason why it's important to know that is, A, if you want to do native applications, you can go do that. But more importantly, we have to understand that React is actually distributed now as two JavaScript files. We have one file which is kind of the core React, and then we have another file which actually allows us to use React within the context of a web browser DOM. So we're going to have to make sure that we reference both of those um, in our Hello World project so that we can not only create the component, but then also render it out to the DOM. Now, as we get over to the code demonstration, you're going to see a certain process flow start to develop. Basically, the process flow is this. We want to define a component, so we're going to actually define what a Hello World component is. Then we're going to instantiate that component through the use of the create element, and then we'll also take a look at how to do that with JSX a little bit later on. And then finally, we're going to place that Hello World um, uh, element actually in the DOM. So we're going to define it, instantiate it, and then place it. Um, also, too, when you see this component, it's important to realize that Hello World is really a function constructor. Okay, so we're going to define this hello world object with create class but the truth is it's actually a function constructor um, uh, and so therefore it can also be defined as a class if you want to use ES 2015 as well also too there this component object or this this constructor function object um, is very similar to what you would see in backbone so if you're familiar with um, with creating backbone models and collections or views and the inheritance structure and how you define properties on the prototype you're actually going to find that the component definition process in React is very similar to this. All right, so let's go ahead and code up a Hello World React demonstration. The first thing we're going to do is actually remove the Hello World content there inside of our div. We're going to be creating a, uh, a Hello World component that we're going to be placing at this particular location in the DOM uh, once it's been instantiated. So we're going to click over to our site JSX file. We have a use strict string literal at the top. And so we're going to go ahead and build this thing out to use React. We're going to do a hello world without JSX, just using the plain old regular uh, JavaScript API. Uh, but this is going to be within the context of Webpack. So you're going to see us using the require function to require the React module uh, into our code. And that's not really a React thing. That's more of a, that's more of a Webpack thing. So I'm going to say const, and we're going to do react equal to require react. So that's going to bring in the react module. We're then going to say react dom and say require react dash dom. There we go. So once we've done that, we're now ready to go ahead and create our first react component. So I'm going to say let hello world equal to react dot create class like that. And then we're going to pass in an object. All react components have to have a render property. This is what actually renders the component. 
So now inside of here, what we're going to do is we're going to create an H1 element. So we can say react dot create element. And in our string text here, we're going to say H1. And then here we're going to pass in null. If we were passing in any type of uh, attributes that we wanted added to the H1, we would pass them in here as a second parameter. And then for the last part here, we're going to specify some text for the actual hello world message. There we go. And finally, we're going to be returning this out of the actual render function itself. So there's our very first hello world component. We now have to basically render this into the DOM using React DOM. So we're going to say React DOM dot render. And then we're going to have to call create element this time, but we're going to call create element on hello world itself. So we're going to say react dot create element hello world. And then finally we have to tell it where to place it in the DOM. So we'll say document dot query selector and we'll simply render it out to the location where we have our class equal to container and we'll put that on a second line so we can see it a little easier there we go so we'll save that then we're gonna transition over to our web browser and we'll go to localhost 8080 and you can see there is our hello world component and if we actually right click on this and inspect the element you'll see in our developer tools here there's our h1 with a react id and then there is the actual text hello world all right next up is jsx and babel as you could start to imagine typing create element to define all the various elements inside your components would become very tedious and honestly it really becomes hard to read so um so uh, the folks at facebook created something called jsx or javascript syntax extension Basically, it looks similar to HTML, but it's really just an alternative syntax for making create element calls. When I first started working with React and I saw this JSX, it kind of threw me off a little bit. I was like, well, you know, it looks like HTML, but really, actually, it's, it's really not. Um, it really is just a simplified syntax. And so what will happen is, is the JavaScript transpiler or the Babel transpiler will take that JSX and will actually convert it out to just plain JavaScript. So when you're looking at it, don't start thinking, oh my goodness, this is just like Angular templates. No, no, nothing like Angular templates whatsoever, okay? Um, in addition to using Babel to do the transpilation, not to regular JavaScript, you also need an editor which supports JSX as well. Uh, this is important because we're not going to be editing the transpiled code. We're going to be editing, editing the JSX code. And a standard text editor, even a good one that just has JavaScript support, isn't going to understand what to do with JSX in terms of syntax highlighting and stuff like that. In fact, you'll get a lot of errors uh, depending upon uh, the type of linting that it's actually doing on the files as you're typing. So instead, you want to look for an editor that actually supports JSX. Um, Visual Studio Code is the one we're using in class. It has the support built in, but you can also use Atom.io and even WebStorm are both great editors for, for doing JSX development. All right, and then ultimately we're going to take Babel and combine it with Gulp so that every time we modify a JSX file, it's automatically transpiled out to JavaScript. That makes it really nice for just you know being able to change a file, save it, and then go refresh it in the web browser without, without having to go manually complete that transpilation process ourselves. So let's take a look here at a quick demo demonstration of how to um, use JSX so we can be more efficient with our coding when creating React components. So let's take a look at how we can transform this uh, Hello World demo over to using JSX. So switching over to JSX is actually pretty easy. Um, we've already, we've already uh, given our file an extension here of JSX and Babel's already configured to process it. To switch it over, all we simply need to do is type in some code. So we'll say Hello World, like that. And then we can take out that piece of code and then we're going to come down here and get rid of the create element. We'll put an opening angle bracket and then a self-closing angle bracket there. And you can see how this looks like HTML and this looks like HTML. 
But what really happens is that JSX is going to convert this back out to the create element statements that we had in the original hello world. So we'll save that. We'll go back to our web browser. We'll reload the page. And there we go. There's hello world. And just to prove that that was in fact our change, we can throw an extra exclamation point on there. Save that and reload. And now you see we have two exclamation points. So as you can see, using JSX does make reading this a whole lot easier. It's less typing, and uh, it's relatively straightforward to get started with. Now that we've created our first component using JSX, let's talk about how to pass some data into that component and then use that data for rendering purposes. Uh, with React components, you really have two types of data that can be stored inside of a component, something called props and something called state. We're going to focus in on props for this, for this next demonstration. So props are basically the immutable parameters of a component. Props can be passed in, but once they're passed in, they, they can't be changed at all. The property values are typically passed in from a, uh, from a parent component. And then once they're passed in, React then takes those property values, takes a look at what the virtual DOM changes were as a part of rendering that component with those property values and then takes a look at the actual DOM and then based upon what the differences are um, it intelligently updates the DOM using a process called reconciliation and you can pass in all kinds of properties properties could be um, values that actually correspond directly to HTML attributes they could also be event handlers they could be other properties for like a list of data or an object that has a bunch of properties with form data, what have you. Properties are the, the primary means by which we actually pass data into a component and then have it displayed in the component when it's rendered in the DOM. Now there is one little side note here concerning um, properties. Uh, whenever we're setting properties for the HTML attributes class and for, we actually have to use a, a property name that's a little bit different. We have to use one called class name for class and HTML4 for 4. And that's because the actual words class and 4 are JavaScript um, keywords. So let's take a quick look here at a demo on how to use um, React component props and how to render them out to the, uh, to the DOM. So let's take a look at how we can pass properties into a React component. So what we're going to do here is we're going to change this now to be an item list. And we'll come down here and change this to item list and we're going to have a property on here called called header and we'll just call it item list this is a good example of passing in a, a property and we'll also pass in a list of items so we'll create ourselves a list of items here so up here we'll say let items equal we'll put in an array and we'll say item one item two and item three. There we go. There's our list of items. So the next thing we're going to do is come up here and modify our item list code to actually display this list of items. So we're going to actually wrap this in a div. The reason being is that when you use JSX, you always have to have an outer container for the JSX to know how to, uh, to, to render the inner content uh, together. So we have our h1, and we want to replace hello world now with a property, so this.props.header. So you can always access your properties um, within a React component through the props property on the this object. So there's our this object, which represents the component, and then the actual props property. Now on this props property is going to be both header as well as items. And what we're going to do is come in here and create an unordered list but then inside of this list, we're actually going to have our items content. Now, we haven't actually created the items content yet. We're going to do that here right now. And we're going to come into here and we're going to make use of some um, JavaScript array capabilities. We're going to say let items. Now, this items right here refers to the items template variable down here. Let items equal to this.props.items dot map function item and then from this we're actually going to return some more JSX li item we're going to close our li tag there put in a semicolon and then put a semicolon here 
So basically, we're going to iterate over the list of items, and what a map function does is basically takes each item, puts it through this function, and then returns back basically a new array. So this is going to be a bunch of actual list item elements that are all going to then be placed here inside of the DOM. So we have our item list, we have our items, and then we have our updated JSX for displaying the header as well as the list of items. Here's our content. And then down here, we are ultimately passing this in through the item list JSX that we have here for our React DOM render. So let's save that and let's go back and look at that in the web browser. We can reload our page and now we see our item list. Now that we've taken a look at how to use props with React components, let's talk about state. State represents the mutable data within, within a, an actual React component. So properties are immutable, but state is mutable. Now the way that we trigger a state change is actually through the setState function. This will actually trigger React to basically re-render the component using the new state values. Uh, usually when we're working in situations where we have a bunch of like child components being composed into a larger component, on that parent component is where we'll actually maintain the state and then propagate that state from the parent down to the children through the use of props. So basically the state is managed on the parent and then each of the child components re receives the current value of that state through its, through its immutable props. So let's explore React component state through a quick demo. So in this demonstration, let's take a look at how we can utilize uh, state in our components. We'll also go ahead and break this thing out into two different components and show how we can start to compose these together. So what we're going to do is we have this, this item li here. We're going to take that and we're actually going to create an actual just item component. So we'll say react.create class put a comma there and then we're going to put a render function on here this will be a really simple render function we're basically just going to say return li but this time on our props what we're going to do is we're going to say this.props.children instead of actually explicitly passing in the content as a property we're going to pass it in as an actual content of this item so then we'll say li semicolon and then we're going to come down here and we're going to take this code right here and we're going to move it. We're going to pull it out of here and we're actually going to put it in line into here. Now what we're going to do that's a little bit different here is instead of saying this dot props we're going to say this dot state. So we're going to put our actual items on the state which we're then later going to be able to update and we're going to iterate over it doing the same map function but instead of saying return li we're going to say return item and then we'll open it and we will also close it there we go and now we're going to come up to here and we'll delete that and we're going to come up here and create a function called get initial prop or get initial state this is actually a built-in function in react and the purpose of this is to initialize the state when the, when the component is first uh, created. So you return whatever you want that state object to be. In this case, we're going to set up our items on it, and we're going to say our items are equal to this.props.items. Um, this is where we actually have an example of passing in something as a property on the outside. And then here inside of it, this is actually going to serve as the state for our actual item list. Iterate, we're going to iterate over the items in that state and then pass in the items into our component up here. And down here we also need to make sure that we put in our close parentheses there for our map function. So now what we want to do is demonstrate how we can add an item to this. Um, in this particular segment we're not going to have a form so we're just going to set up a little bit of a set timeout to run after a period of time to then add an item to the actual list and we can see how um, when the state changes, the, um, the component actually re-renders itself. So we'll do set timeout function, and we'll simply have this run after two seconds. And what we're going to do is we're going to grab our list of items off of the state variable here, so this.items. Then we'll say items.push item4. Then we have to call another special function in React called setState. 
So we'll say this dot set state, and we're going to set our items like this. Now I could have done this in fewer lines of code, but just for the sake of teaching, um, I've expanded this out to multiple lines of code. And then finally down here, I need to make sure that I have my right value of this. So I'm going to bind this and say this. That way the value of this inside of the function for set timeout is actually the React component itself. So let's save this code and let's go run this and um, see if we made any mistakes. So I'm going to reload it. Looks like it loaded up for us. All right, but our new item's not being added to the list. So how would we debug this situation? First of all, let's come over to our developer tools and let's take a look at what we've got here. So it looks like we don't really see anything here. So what this probably means is that there was a JSX compilation problem. So to, 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 check, to, to follow up on that, we can come over here to our console window and take a look. There actually was a problem. So it says position 17, column 15. Now sometimes this is very helpful. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes I actually have to restart this whole process because it just doesn't transform the JSX the way that I would like it to in terms of handling errors. So let's take a look at what we have here. So I've got my ah items colon this dot props dot items that should be pluralized so let's save that but I don't think that's actually the cause of our problem. Nope doesn't look like it. So let's go ahead and kill this and we'll run it again. So we're going to run this again and then if there's still a problem with our JSX it'll give us an error here when it starts and if there's not then it'll just run it. So let's go back over to our web browser. It doesn't look like there was a problem. And let's reload. And there's our list. Hey, and there's our item 4. So it looked like our problem was just we left the S off here in our thing. Um, sometimes when working with JSX, it can be a little frustrating with Gulp trying to get it to process. So if things aren't acting the way you expect them to, just go back over to the command prompt and see if there's an error. And um, if, if you're still not getting anywhere, just restart it. Just kill the gulp process, restart it. And if there's an error on the restart, then it will tell you, and then you can go fix it and then start it again. But there you go. We were able to add a new item to our list. We called set state, which triggered the re-render. It updated the list. We also created a new item component here. So now we're composing our components together. And uh, we utilize this set timeout here to actually push it on. And then, of course, we initialized our state with get initial state. Okay, so now that we've taken a look at how React state works, let's take a look at how Forms and React work together. Now, the way that Forms and React work together is significantly different from other frameworks and libraries. The challenge here is that React, Re React components always have to stay in sync with the DOM. And so a lot, of, a lot of developers don't realize this, but when you type into an input control, you update the actual value property on the DOM itself, but the value attribute on the element is not updated. Well, the problem is that means that the actual input control is now out of sync with what the actual React component data is in the virtual DOM. So when you work with React, you basically have to wire up a mechanism where when a person types into the box, you're actually triggering the DOM, the DOM attribute for the input control to actually be updated to that new value on each and every keystroke. And so React allows you to do this by hooking into the onChange event, which you can then run a function and trigger an update to the component state. And depending upon the configuration of the component, that state data may propagate down via properties to where the input control is. And then the input controls DOM is actually modified so that the actual value attribute now reflects the newly typed in value. So this is a little bit different approach to keeping things in sync, but this allows for React to basically ensure that the DOM always reflects the actual component data. Now when you're working with form controls with React, you actually have two types of form controls. You have what are called controlled. These are the ones that are hooked into the onChange event. And then you have uncontrolled. Uncontrolled components can be initially set with a default value from the um, component data, 
but they don't trigger any of the update mechanisms in terms of updating component state whenever data is typed into them. They're basically, they're basically separated from the context of the actual React forms themselves. So now let's take a look at a demonstration of how we can use forms with React and take a look at how things are being updated through the on change event and the propagation of state and props. So let's take a look at how we can incorporate a form into our item list here to actually be able to add new items to the list. Now our file here with all of these components is starting to get a little, a little, um, a little cluttered. And so what we're going to do is we're going to break this out into multiple files. So we're going to be incorporating a little bit of the Webpack module um, component system to uh, Okay, so now that we've been able to build an item list, we're going to now incorporate a form into this so we can add new items. As part of that, we're going to go ahead and break this thing out into multiple files. We're going to use Webpack's module system uh, to basically allow us to have uh, one component per file and then incorporate all of those components into our single site JSX file here. So to do that, what we're going to do is underneath our JS folder, we're going to create a new folder called components. So there's our components folder. And under this we're going to create a new file called item.jsx. We'll create another new file called item-list.jsx. And then finally we'll create another new file called itemform.jsx. Great. So we're going to first come over here and we're going to grab this item right here and we'll just copy all of that code right there. We're going to copy it and we're going to paste it right into here. Now the way we're going to do this is if you're familiar with the common JS module specification, that's what we're going to be utilizing here with Webpack for breaking this thing apart. So um, as part of this we of course need to keep the require for the React, but we don't need the React DOM here because there's no there's no dependency on the React DOM in this part of our application. So we'll just take that out right there, but we'll leave React. And then what we're going to do is with the common JS module specification, we can basically say module.exports. And then we can export whatever it is we're exporting. In this case, where we're exporting a React component. So we can just say module.exports equals to uh, react.create class and then we'll put our semicolon there and then now this is going to be exported out of here and then we can include this inside of our site JSX file. So when we go to include it, it will look something like this. We'll have item equal to require. Now because we're not going to be pulling this from the node modules folder, we're going to be pulling it from our local file system here as part of our project. We have to make sure we say dot slash components slash item dot jsx and that will pull in our jsx file for that. So the next thing we need to do is actually move our item list over. So we'll go back over to here and we're actually we'll just copy this whole file since we'll just copy this whole file since most of it is the item list anyways and we'll paste that right into here and now up here we can get rid of the React DOM, but we will need the actual item itself. So there we go, so there's our item. We can get rid of the, um, the item definition since we move that to another file. We'll change this to module.exports. There we go, so now we have this being exported out. We're going to come down here and actually remove all of this code. That'll be supplied by the site JSX. And we'll just go ahead and indent that out. Perfect. Okay. So there's our actual item list. The next thing we're going to need to do here is actually add a function for adding, um, adding items to the list. So we'll add an add item function here. There we go. And then inside of this function, we're simply going to take the code from our set timeout. We'll pull that out and drop that into there like that. All right, so now we'll, um, 
we'll get our new item passed in here. And so we'll just take new item, copy that, push that onto the array. All the rest of this code can stay the same. We can now come in here and simplify our render function. So we have a reference to our item up here. And then here inside of our, um, our create class, we have our new add item function for adding things to the list. What we're going to need to do down here is we're going to need to add a new item called item form. So we'll say item form, and then we'll say add item. And then we want to use this dot add item to actually add the item. So what this is going to do now is we're going to basically pass in an event handler into this item form. And then inside of item form, it'll actually trigger this event handler passing in the new item that we want to add. We'll also go ahead and add a reference here in our to our item form up here, even though we haven't really created it yet. We'll say item form, and then item dash form, just like this. Very good. And then we'll come back down to our site JSX, and we'll change this to item list, and we'll say item list, and we'll save that like that. And we can actually take out all of the definitions here for item list and item. There we go. And then now we can simply reference item list. We have item list. There's our items. And now everything is kind of bound up inside of item list. So we're composing those components and then exposing it out um, through this one item list component. So now let's go ahead and create our item form. To do this, we're going to say use strict. And then we'll come into here and we're going to say uh, const react equal to require. And then we'll say um, uh, react. There we go. And module.exports. And we'll say react uh, create class. And then we'll pass in some functionality here. Now, what we're going to need to do is we're going to first need to initialize our states. We're going to say get initial state. All right, and then inside of a get initial state, we're going to return out our state object that we want to use. So we'll have a new item, make it an empty string. The next thing we need to do is we're going to need to set up a couple of functions. So we're going to have one called on change, and it's going to receive an event object. We'll come back and fill that out later. Then we need another function called add item. All right, and this is going to ultimately be the function which invokes the add item from our from our parent component. So we'll say e. And then finally we have our render function itself. Okay, so let's start with the render function first. We're going to return, we'll have a form. You can see how much easier using JSX is as opposed to creating all of those create elements. Now we're going to have a label. We'll say new item. Now we're going to actually add an input element here. And we'll give it an ID of new item. So what we're going to want to do is associate this label here with our actual new item. So we're going to say HTML4. Since 4 is a JavaScript uh, keyword, we can't just use 4 directly. So this is one of those special uh, properties where we have to uh, spell it a little bit differently. So it's called HTML4. And then we'll say new item. And then we'll come into here, and we're going to set up our value to be equal to our this.state.newItem. So what's going to happen is, as this new item state is changed, because we type into the box, it will be re-rendered here out to the value attribute. And then inside of here, we're going to set up an on change. If we don't have an on change, it will effectively make this input read only because it will never re-render it and update it. In order to have it re-rendered and updated, we actually have to handle the change of people typing into the box. And so for that, we're going to actually run our this.onChange function. So up here is where we're going to handle that on change. So what we'll do for this is we're going to say um, this dot set state, and then we're going to set the new item property, which is the one that we're using here, and we're simply going to say e dot target dot value, 
and that will grab whatever the uh, the value is for this particular input element, set it on new item, and then when it re-renders, it will update the value of this input control um, oh, for according to whatever the value on the state is. Once we have that, we then need to come in here and actually set up a button. So we'll have a button. Because the button is inside of a form element, we need to make sure that we set the type to button, otherwise it will actually trigger an old-fashioned form submit, and we don't want to do that. So we'll have type button, and then we're going to have um, on click. So that's the uh, event handler for clicking the button, and we'll say this dot add item. There we go, and then we'll say add item for the button text, so on and so forth. Now we can come back up here and actually implement add item. For this, all we're going to do is basically invoke the add item that we passed in on our property. If you remember from back here in item list, we passed in a property called add item, which is a reference to a function. So we're simply going to, simply going to come in here and say this dot props dot add item, and then we'll pass in this dot state dot new item that, refl that will reflect the current current state of our new item uh, input control. And then finally, we're going to set the state again, and uh, we're going to initialize new item to blank. So after we add it, we want to blank it out so that another new item can be added. So you can see here, it's a little bit of an involved process for setting this up. We're basically having to hook into the change event of the input control to properly update the state. We have to pass in an event handler from the parent control so that we can pass up this value up to the parent where it can be managed ultimately on the state of the overall component. And then down here we had to remember our HTML4 to associate the label to the, um, to the input. And then of course we had to remember some good old fashioned HTML in terms of setting the type here to button. But if we come over here to item list we'll see that we've got our item form. We're actually building our list here, referencing our item. And then here we have our add item event handler. So let's come down to site JSX. We've got our React, React DOM. There's our item list, our items. And then we're rendering this thing out to the DOM. Now we, we've made a lot of changes here, so let's go and check our actual um, our actual gulp process to see if we have any problems. Let's see here, site JSX, uh, line 14, column 1. Yeah, there's not even a line 14 here anymore, so why don't we go ahead and we'll just restart this process. And we're going to run gulp here and see if it finds, if finds any errors. Okay, it looks like here Webpack can't find our item list file, and actually the reason for this is actually a mistake on my end. Whenever I work with CommonJS, I, I always, for whatever reason, when I'm typing stuff out, I'll leave the file name extensions on the paths. So you can see here it's trying to load up item list JSX, but the problem is it's actually, the JSX is throwing it off. So if we come over here and we actually change this to simply be item list, then we'll be good to go. And we need to also go into the item list uh, file and also make the change there. So we'll remove the JSX from here. In addition to removing the JSX, we also need to make sure this is relative. So whenever you start typing out these paths, be careful and not, uh, not add extra extensions when they're not needed. Also, we'll also see here where the semicolon actually needs to be a comma. There we go. So let's save that. Let's come back over to our gulp. And we'll run it again. And let's verify that everything processes correctly, both our JSX as well as our JavaScript and module stuff. Looks like we're good to go. So we'll come back over to our web browser here. Ah, so here's our item list. And we can come in here and we can add a new item. We'll say item 4. And there's our new item added to the list. Also, too, if we click on new item, check it out how it highlights this box. That means that we did our four attribute correctly. All right, so in conclusion, React is a great way to build web browser UIs. It's definitely a different approach to building UI components than what you might experience with a Backbone or an Angular. It focuses on JavaScript, so if you love writing JavaScript, you're going to love writing React components. The DOM updates are very efficient because React basically manages that whole process for you. 
It, um, it manages it through the use of the virtual DOM and its reconciliation process. Um, on components, we have two types of data. We have props and state. Props are basically immutable. Once the values are passed in, they, have to, they can't change. They, they uh, stay the same. And then state is something that can be changed. It is mutable. And changing it triggers components to be redrawn. Uh, but in order to keep things uh, simple, we want to make sure that we're maintaining state in as few components as possible and then use those state values and propagate them down to child components through their properties. And finally, React keeps the virtual DOM, the DOM, and form control synchronized through the use of the onChange event handlers. Thank you for taking the time to go through this course. I hope this information has been beneficial, and uh, I wish you all the best in your future React development.